At Computex 2022, AMD talked about their highly anticipated Zen 4 Ryzen 7000 CPUs for the desktop. The information given to us was limited, however based on what I saw, I have to say I'm quite underwhelmed and this might be a generation that I can see a lot of people skipping. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. So on Monday, AMD held their annual tech conference at Computex 2022. It surprisingly wasn't that long, only a little over 30 minutes, but there was quite a lot of new tech they showed off. The first half of the conference was more focused on their new laptop chips, new notebooks coming from their partners, and various software features they've added to their laptop ecosystem. Laptops aren't generally what I focus on at this channel, and I'd rather wait until they're actually available on the market to see which ones are good, so I'm not going to be going over that info here. What I wanted to focus on for this video was the information that AMD had provided us pertaining to their next generation Zen 4 Ryzen 7000 series CPUs for the desktop. While they didn't unveil any new SKUs or talk about pricing, they did share information in regards to performance, new platform features, and the details of the node it's using. Along with that, they did also share a bunch of information surrounding their next generation AM5 socket and the new motherboards. Getting into the meat and potatoes of the announcement, I wanted to talk about the info Lisa Su provided us for Zen 4. There has been a lot of chatter within the PC hardware community where many are calling Zen 4 a disappointment, a flop, and that it's too slow. But before we get into any sort of judgmental statements, let's go over what she had to share with us. One of the major changes Zen 4 will have over Zen 3 is that they have doubled the amount of L2 cache per core. Zen 3 only had 0.5 megabytes of L2 cache per core, so a 5800X, for example, only had 4 megabytes of L2 cache. And something like a 5950X, which has 16 cores, will only have 8 megabytes of L2 cache. In Zen 4's case, a 16 core Ryzen 7000 CPU will have 16 megabytes of L2 cache. Now, right after that, it says greater than 15% single threaded uplift. This was a major focus for a lot of folks, and I thought it was quite peculiar AMD mentioned 15% single threaded uplift rather than talking about how much they've improved in regards to IPC. If you listen carefully to what Lisa Su had to say, she mentioned that with higher IPC and faster clock speeds, they were able to attain this 15% uh, uplift. So she's talking about them together. They expect Zen 4 to provide an improvement of more than 15% compared to the previous generation with them together. We've also increased the clock speeds on Zen 4 to run significantly above 5 gigahertz. And with higher IPC and faster clock speeds, we expect Zen 4 CPUs to deliver more than 15% higher single threaded performance compared to the prior generation. This was really interesting because for all the previous generations, AMD has always mentioned how much they've improved IPC. They did it with Zen 1, they did it with Zen Plus, even though it was just a meager 3% IPC increase, and then they did it with Zen 2 and Zen 3. However, with Zen 4, they're being reluctant on sharing that information. Maybe because it might not be as high as everyone was expecting it to be, and that most likely will be the case. Zen 4 probably won't have as large of a leap in terms of IPC when compared to Zen 3. Maybe not even a double digit improvement which is concerning. I'll circle back to that in just a moment. Along with that she also mentions that Zen 4 has support for new AI instruction sets that can be used for accelerating workloads and machine learning. In regards to fabrication info, she shows a physical pre-production sample of a 16 core Ryzen 7000 CPU. The core triplets will have 8 Zen 4 cores and it's manufactured using TSMC's high performance 5 nanometer node. So this is a new node, not their older 7 nanometer node. There is also a new IO die, and the most appealing change for the new IO die is the inclusion of RDNA 2 graphics. This is fantastic because compared to Intel, this was an area AMD was lacking in. I mean, we know we have APU products, but generally they've always had inferior performance when compared to their non-APU counterparts. This way users can have the benefit of having integrated graphics that they can leverage for other tasks, maybe recording, or just having a backup video out for troubleshooting. After that, she handed it off to David McAfee, 
who talked about the new AM5 platform and the new motherboards, which I do want to talk about later on in the video. After that, Lisa Sue comes back on stage and shows us a couple of demos. The first demo is of a pre-production 16 core Ryzen 7000 CPU running Ghostwire Tokyo. No FPS or any other stats were shown except for the fact that they have a frequency monitor and we can see it running at around 5.5 GHz. Lisa Sue did state that they have tweaked Zen 4 to run with frequencies significantly above 5 GHz. I want to highlight the fact that she she says significantly, and the fact that this is a pre-production model running at 5.5 GHz is quite impressive, a very considerable leap from Zen 3 CPUs. Therefore, I believe that there's a pretty good chance that the final retail samples will probably run faster than that, though we'll just have to wait and see how that will play out. The second demo was showcasing the same 16-core CPU, battling it out against Intel's flagship 12900K, Alder Lake CPU and Blender. It was a pretty short render, but AMD showed their CPU being 31% faster in this specific render. Although some people on Twitter were pointing out that in the footnotes given the times of the render, depending on how you calculate it, AMD was 46% faster. So it's quite interesting they mentioned that. Now, with AMD showing the gaming demo of the 16-core processor running at 5.5 GHz, that's about a 12% increase in boost over the previous generation 16 core processor from the uh, Zen 3 family, the 5950X. If you recall, that CPU had an official max boost of 4.9 GHz, and Lisa Su said that combining IPC and higher frequency, they're able to get more than 15% single threaded performance, which tells me that Zen 4 will really only have a... 3-5% to 5 increase when it comes to IPC if the vast majority of single-threaded improvement is coming from the faster clocks. They did also include some info in their footnotes mentioning how this was calculated using Cinebench R23 single-threaded test. This is a little bit disappointing to see because Zen 4 is on a brand new node and a lot of people myself were included were you know at least hoping for double-digit IPC gains. Another reason why this is also concerning is because Intel might make another leap with Raptor Lake when it comes to IPC gains. If we take a look at some data from Guru3D's review of the 12900K, specifically their IPC section, which I definitely appreciate that they take the time to include this data, we can see that Alder Lake is only about a percent faster when it comes to IPC when compared to Zen 3 Vermeer. And you might be thinking then what's the big deal if AMD will have about a 3 to 5% IPC gain over Zen 3 and there will be clock speed improvements then they'll have the fastest gaming CPUs. Well the thing is Zen 4 isn't going to be competing against Alder Lake, its main competitor will be Raptor Lake. If Intel improves clock speeds for Raptor Lake and say they get close to 6 GHz and they improve IPC by 10% then Raptor Lake might end up smashing Zen 4 and that's not even taking into account the increase in e-cores for Raptor Lake where they're going to have the multi-core advantage as well. So not only will AMD end up losing to Intel in gaming, but also in productivity and content creation workloads. For the first time in quite a while, I'm actually more excited about Intel's next generation than AMD's. Though, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, we'll just have to wait and see what the final SKUs will look like. There's still a lot of info we just don't have to make any sort of concrete conclusions. This is all theoretical based on the info we have right now. Games are multi-threaded now and single-threaded performance isn't everything. The increase in L2 might significantly push gaming performance further than what we are speculating based on the clock speed improvements and IPC. A good example of that is the 5800X 3D. This CPU has no IPC gains over the vanilla 5800X and is actually slower in synthetic single-threaded workloads, but when it comes to gaming, it's significantly faster, all because it has such a large pool of cash. So not all hope is lost for Zen 4. Moving on, and I just briefly wanted to talk about the highlights of next generation motherboards. These next generation motherboards will have up to 28 PCIe lanes, AMD will now be using an LGA socket similar to what Intel is using, and it will have native support up to 170 watts, though motherboard manufacturers will allow you to go higher of course. There will also be support for DDR5 and PCIe 5.0, which will provide a lot more bandwidth, but there is no mention of DDR4, which means that if you're looking at Zen 4, you're going to have to pay premium prices for DDR5 DIMMs, whereas with Alder Lake and Raptor Lake, you have the option to choose DDR4 and get cheaper prices. And from the benchmarks we have seen with Alder Lake, DDR5 really presents no sort of benefit for gaming. It might be different with Zen 4, so that's why AMD is pushing for DDR5. Which means though, if you are going to be looking at this kind of platform, 
there's higher costs associated with it. The nice convenient thing about AM5 is that it will be compatible with existing AM4 coolers. I did make a separate video talking about that and went over some statements made by cooler manufacturers regarding this. They also talk about the IO having new super speed USB standards, Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2 LE support, and HDMI 2.1 along with DisplayPort 2. So it looks like the IO is loaded and that is something I can always appreciate. As for the motherboards, still have three chipsets, X670E which stands for Extreme and will be targeted towards the enthusiasts and high-end overclockers. These motherboards will be the ones that will have all the bells and whistles, all sorts of I.O., very beefy VRMs, and PCIe 5.0 support everywhere. Now that's interesting because for the regular X670 motherboards, they do support PCIe 5.0, but only for the primary graphics slot, which for most people shouldn't be an issue because everyone's just using a single graphics solution these days. However, for their new B650 motherboards, while they do offer 5.0 support, it's only for storage, which means that the GPU slot will only be utilizing PCIe 4.0 standard. Kind of a shame that they would gimp their mainstream boards like this, but I have a pretty good reason as to why they probably did this. When B550 launched with PCIe 4.0, a lot of tech reviewers basically said that for the vast majority of users, just get the B550 motherboards, save your money because they basically offer all the same sort of features as X570, just not as much lanes, which again for most users is fine. So by not having the new 5.0 standard on their mainstream boards, they can use that to upsell people to their higher end boards. We'll have to wait until PCIe 5.0 GPUs are out and test them with both 5.0 and 4.0 standards to see how much performance is impacted. I don't think it will be a lot, but we'll have to wait and see. So that will do it for AMD's Computex coverage. Gotta say I was hoping to see Zen 4 bring us a larger leap in performance than what they showed off. Maybe things might improve come launch, but from what I could tell it really does seem like this is all it has to offer. I've been an enthusiast who's purchased a wide variety of Zen CPUs from Zen 1, and Zen 4 seems like a generation that I might actually end up skipping for a personal upgrade. It might be fun to get one just to play around with the higher frequency headroom, but that's really about it. I'll probably make another video sometime in the future discussing this topic. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.